Hello, everyone joining us. All right. This is season two, our first episode of the Tough Lift podcast. I'm your host, Matt Adamchak. And today for our guest for our first episode, so technically episode 21, but the first episode of season two, thank you for coming back. If you did listen, and those of you that are joining us for the first time ever, welcome. Uh, our guest kicking us off is Sean Waxman. Those of you that don't know him, uh, definitely Google Hop on Wiki, even. I think they have a good article on you. Uh, the guy's been known for quite a hot second. Sean will give us a quick uh, synopsis, I guess you'd say, of his history of weightlifting. But there's many, many stories. Definitely the guy to sit around and listen to tales from. Um, but I know I've watched Sean and Sean's team and Sean's athletes and listened to Sean as a coach for many years since becoming an athlete and a coach. Uh, and I was really excited when I finally got the chance to sit with him at the Arnold a few weeks ago and actually invite him onto the podcast. Um, so Sean, again, thank you for taking the time out to, uh, especially in your busy schedule, you have a book coming out on soon. And that's one of the reasons I also wanted to have you on once I had heard about your book and what you were talking about, I was very interested in it. Um, but thank you for taking the time out and coming on the podcast, man. Thanks for having me. I always uh, appreciate it very much. Um, so, Sean, obviously, like I said, I've been following you and your lifters for like a number of years. Um, those of you that don't know you, that are either watching on YouTube or on the podcast, listening on their way to car, uh, in their car on the way to work or anything, let's let's give like a quick debrief on, you know, uh, who is Sean Waxman? We don't need to go all the way back to you know your uh, your ninth grade sports trophies, but like. Where are people going to know you from? Where are the people going to know or why they should listen, I guess, is the the good question. I've been uh, a coach professionally uh, for 30 years. It's my, it would be my 30th year. So I started as a strength and conditioning coach in 94, uh, and I was a weightlifter at the same time. I uh, graduated uh, undergrad and then decided that uh, I wanted to be a, a strength coach. Um, and I also wanted to become a weightlifter so I can learn the intricacies of how to move a barbell. So I, I kind of I, I learned that, that weightlifting incorporated all the lifts, the squatting and pressing and all the things that we do in strength and conditioning as well. So, you know, I actually, you know, I wanted to be a weightlifter early on, but I, but I, I got into weightlifting more so I could learn how to how to perform these these movements. Uh, so much so that you know to, to to do it long enough and hard enough for it to make a change in my body, feel that that process, what it feels like, so I can better articulate it to my athletes. You know, I'm a big believer in you got to do the thing in order to teach the thing. Uh, I, I know some huge, huge believer in that concept as well. Yeah. I mean, I know there's some people that, that, that go against those, uh, that have excelled in spite of that. Um, and that's great and kudos to them. But I think the vast majority of people who are successful at teaching and coaching have, have performed the thing that they're trying to teach a coach, uh, to a high level. I don't mean necessarily with accomplishments, you know, medals and things like that. But, you know, they were in it for a long enough period of time to understand the nuances of what it is. So anyway, that's that's what I I first set out to do. And and I didn't know how good or bad I was going to be in weightlifting. And, and uh, I I turned out to be pretty good early on. And and, um, and uh, at the same time, I was I had started my strength and conditioning career. I was at uh, LA City College and College of the Canyons. And then I was with the, uh, 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 I was the head strength coach for the Long Beach Ice Dogs, which is uh, the LA Kings uh, minor league affiliate. And I was assistant with the LA Kings, did some work with uh, a sports agent uh, through my relationship with Kobe Bryant and his strength coach, who was my teammate, Joe Carbone. Uh, he introduced me to his agent, and I started working with professional basketball players, um, and all at the same time as a competitive athlete. And then I did that for about almost 15 years, and uh, and 
I retired at 31 and, and then opened up my own training facility. I had been working with other people and then um, continued in strength and conditioning until about 2007, 2008. And then I opened up Waxman's Gym, which was a weightlifting only gym in, in Los Angeles. And I had that gym in, uh, in LA from 2008 to 2020 when I closed, when I closed that down and moved out to Utah. Uh, and now I continue to coach weightlifting. I have never stopped. I have, uh, it's not, it's not my business anymore. Like it used to be. I think you guys are crazy for doing that now, but God bless you. I'm glad somebody's doing it, but, uh, I still, you know, I still, still coaching weightlifting at a high level. Uh, but I'm back into strength and conditioning. I have been for the last uh, three years. Started at the high school that I'm at now and left the high school to go to to the college level. I was strength coach at University of Utah. And then uh, spent a season there and then came back to the high school. And that's where I'm at now. So uh, I've been doing that. I'm, a, I'm the state director for the National High School Strength Coaches Association as well. So I'm really trying to get more involved in that space uh, from the more than just coaching like I did with weightlifting. You know, I was on the board of directors for weightlifting and, and um, I just, I don't want to be involved at that level anymore. Uh, it's kind of like uh, pissing in the wind a little bit. So yeah. uh, um, I think I can make a bigger impact in the high school strength and conditioning world. I think there's a real opportunity to, to make an impact in that, in that field. So I'm um, focusing a lot of my energy uh, on that right now. So yeah, that's the, actually, the, I actually <laughs> watched a post. I actually watched a post you uh, posted today about the, the college strength coaches and the college football coaches and that whole paradigm. And that an actually, what you, what you posted on that is actually why most people don't, a lot, I don't talk about like my transition from army to outside a lot of what I like was going to do. Um, cause it's all just was is right. Nobody gives a shit about the was is um, but I, I was actually looking at college sports and, uh, going into college sports. Cause I thought that would be cool. Like I, I love strength and conditioning and planning. And I was in charge of our, our physical fitness for not only like my unit, but like our battalion level. Mm. And, um, and like, so I was getting good at programming out for large groups, et cetera, and like stuff like that. And uh, Coach Bob was friends with like Bo Sandoval over at U of M. And I was lucky enough to like go in there a few times and like train there with him and see how they were operating there and just like hearing him talk about it. And like, great coach. All those guys that were there were great. But then like being told that like, yeah, they could all get wiped in an instant. Yeah. I was, I was like, no, nope. <laughs> no, well, I'm gone. <laughs> and this is one of, one of the reasons why I've, you know, I've really never had a job working for yeah. somebody, you know, yeah. it, it, especially as an adult, uh, because if I'm going to succeed or fail, uh, it's going to be because decision. of things that I do. Bingo. You know, for sure. I, I'm not, I, I just, I don't feel comfortable being judged by somebody that doesn't know what they're looking at. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. So I had, I struggle with that. You know, it's not like I, I, I play, I, I can play fine with others, Yeah. you know, but it's, it's gotta be others that I respect that have the, you know, at least a, 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 a base level of understanding of what it is we're trying to do. Yeah. So, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the scourge of middle management. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, it's not just strength. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Middle management is killing productivity and we have a lot of middle management and strength and condition. So, yeah. so I, uh, I'm going to choose my own path. Like I always no, do. I feel you, man. <laughs> that's, um, that's that's one of the reasons I chose to start my own place because I was like interviewing with agencies and police departments when I was looking to transition out of strength and conditioning, and then I eventually was just like, I'll just um go broke or start weightlifting. But the other thing that I loved out of that intro, man, my wife won't love it because I say it all the time is like, you said I retired at thirty one. 
Yeah. And like, that was, I tell people all the time that like, I, we have a connection issue potentially. So I might be talking over you, but if not, all right. So like I was saying, you, you mentioned that you retired when you were 31 out of that intro. And that is, that is like out of everything. I heard that loud because I say all the time, my wife hates it is like, I retired when I got out of the army because my, my job is my passion. And it's like, I, I enjoy the shit out of it. And whether, I mean, whether I'm addicted to it or what, I don't give a shit. Like I enjoy it and it's fun. And I don't feel like I'm working a majority of the time. I'm choosing to do what I do out of passion, not because I need to go there and like make money so I can put bread on bread on the table and shit. And that, hearing you say that was like really cool. Now, the thing I won't say, because I I don't want to say I pissed Ursula off, but uh, I won't say after you said you coached for 30 years how old I am. We'll just avoid that part of the intro. <laughs> so um, well, so yeah. with that. <laughs> um, yeah, when I, you know, I retired from, you know, when I say retired, I mean, you know, retired from being an athlete, right? So I... Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. knew that at that point, my ability to perform athletically was never going to be uh, the same after yeah. that, right? I knew that I was on the I downside know. of of my capacity to, to be an athlete. And I had no desire to do it worse than I was doing it before. So, uh, although... Yeah, uh, oddly enough, I was, you know, I felt like I had figured a lot of things out um, at that point and was going to make one more run. And then I had an injury that actually forced me to, to, to stop, um, which, you know, it's disappointing, but it is what it is. Uh, and then from that point on, I, I went into being an, uh, being an entrepreneur um, and figuring out what I was going to do for the rest of my life. But I knew it was going to revolve around the barbell and coaching and, and things like that. And, and I just set up my life to where I can do, I can pursue the things that I was, that I, that I was passionate about. And, you know, my metrics for success, uh, you know, have never been uh, related to, financial reward although it's important obviously it's really important mm. uh, but i don't i i chose things because i thought you know, where can i make the biggest difference in in my in the world that i choose to live in and that's always been my driving motivation and i've always felt that if you're good enough at something you'll get paid Right. You know, because the, the, if you're good enough at it, there's a high perceived value for what you do. And then people will want to pay, will want that expertise and then they'll pay you for it. So and we're never going to get Absolutely, paid. Man. Absolutely. Yeah. We're, you know, I'm never going to get paid what I'm worth. But most, you know, most people who are good at things are never rarely paid what they're worth. You know, they'll they'll, they'll pay what what people perceive the value is. You know, uh, we don't really set the market. Um, and then, yeah. you know, you struggle with, do you want to, how many people do you want to price out? You know, so if you want to help a lot of people, then that's going to affect your, you know, your, your, your price point. So it's a good, anyway, you know, yeah. I, I chose this because um, I enjoy it, but I'm good at it. And I think I can, and, and I can make an impact. So that's why yeah, I do the absolutely. things I do. Uh, and that's why I'm uh, still doing it. Yeah. And then, Sean, just um, for those people that, again, that don't know you, like weight class, top lifts, like lay all oh. that shit out for everyone, man. Throw that shit out, those stats. Uh, I was a uh, – so I, I was a big weight. Like that. That's important. The years yeah. you were lifting. I don't – I mean – it's so in the, in the past. Oh, um, I was a heavyweight at first when the heavyweight was 110. Then it moved to 108. Uh, and then it went to 105. And then I was fat and already. So uh, my coach asked me to go up 
to Supers. And I spent some time up there. And then I, I just couldn't stay healthy. Because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm bigger than average, but I'm not super big. You, know, you I, I stand next to some of these guys, you know, Mario Martinez or, you know, or, or, or Shane or some of these other guys. And, you know, we might weigh near the same, but they're just taking up a lot more space than I am. <laughs> so uh, I eventually went back down to the heavyweight and I actually did my best lifting or at least equal to my best lifting at when I went down the second time. Um, you know, I think, I think my best competitive lifts are probably 55 and 90 something, uh, more in training, but that doesn't count. Uh, you know, I practice all American, I suppose. Uh, I did, I did fine. Yeah. You know, I, I I was always, you know, oftentimes I was one made lift away from, from meddling. You know, I meddled at a few meets, but, you know, that last snatch or that last clean and jerk uh, would have, you know, put me, so a lot of that, so, I'm, you know, it, which has really helped me become a better coach because I look, I look back at those, at, at those failures and I, and I say, I'm not, my athletes aren't going to be the same thing, be me. You know they're going to be better than I was, so yep. I was just athletic and strong and fast and and you know I was more of that than a, than a good weightlifter. So I think I became a good weightlifter uh, at thirty. Finally, you know after like after seven or eight years of of doing it, you know, I figured it out, especially the mental part of it, um, and I was healthy enough at that point to take advantage of the improved uh, uh, cognitive end of it. And, um, and but th by that time, it was too late. So I did okay again. And, and uh, I actually made one of the thrills of my life back then. Drug testing was very different. Uh, so I got a letter in the mail. I don't know what year it was, 90-something. And I got, he said, hey, you have to sign up for drug testing. So the, they only drug tested the top 15. So which was considered back then like a national team type of thing. So uh, I got that letter and I knew I, I kind of was like, all right, I'm big time now. I'm, uh, that was it. Yeah, I'm, you I'm, made I'm, it. I'm it was real, real. For a fleeting moment. And then, uh, yeah. but anyway. People uh, still celebrate that shit, man. Yeah. Uh, I wish one of, one of my lifters got uh, tested again this last Arnold and he posted something today. Cause he like just PR his double and he posted it on Instagram. Like, like he posted USADA, like what did, what did it say? He posted like, like just PR my double back squat gain season coming around. USADA better be ready. And I was like, can you oh, take yeah. that down please? Like, I don't, I don't want that. He <laughs> don't, like, I know you're being silly, but like we don't want that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's something you He's don't. Not want. doing anything by any means, for the record. <laughs> well, we'll find out soon enough. <laughs> Jesus I was like, come on, bud. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's, that's, that's my awesome, man. Those are good numbers. Those are still extreme. Listen, listen, I, I am not going to sit here. Anyone that knows me, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I don't dog on male American athletes. I dog on male American athletes and like, to be blunt, there's a reason there's a history, like, especially since the females came on board, like males have had a rough time competing in this sport in the United States. And it's been a rocky road for males. And like, those are still really good fucking numbers for males these days. So like, those are strong numbers, man. Yeah. No problem. I, uh, I, you know, my biggest issue as an athlete was, you know, I never enjoyed what was going on. You know, it was yeah. always, you know, my, I looked at what the guys were doing in other countries and, you know, I consider, then I'd look at what I'm doing. I'm like, oh, I'm a complete failure. So, yeah. um, and it's not the way to, it's not the right way to look at it. 
you know, and I wish I spent more time enjoying the process. It, and I didn't enjoy the process. I, it was life or death for me every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a terrible way to go through that, that, that time, you know, without ever giving yourself a break. It was just, you know, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. You got to be better. You got to be better. You know, that coupled with, you know, not really doing the things that I needed to do outside of training. You know, I didn't do a great job taking care of myself outside of training. And then I'm pushing myself to, you know, until exhaustion, you know, every day and doing it 24 hours. Like, you know, I'm not, it's not stopping. You know, I'm, I'm living my life with the same velocity and intensity that I do in training outside of training. Yep. And, you know, it just was a, it was, it was hard. Uh, and, but all those things are great because they make me a better coach. You know, I've set expectations for my athletes about how to live your life, you know, and, and uh, look, it's not by example as an athlete, you know, this is, I'm telling you, this is why it doesn't work. Yep. So, yeah, I feel um, there. Yeah, so I think all those, I think the mistakes we make um, can be either good or bad. You know, they're, they're, they're bad if you keep on making the same mistake and don't change anything. They're great because they're lessons that we can take and, and, and say, okay, well, let's make sure this doesn't happen again. And then, you know, how do you articulate that experience to the people you're trying to help? So, yeah. um, take it as a learning, learning piece. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and I have a lot of mistakes, so it makes me very wise as a coach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I tell people that all the time. I like, um, here's a tip and it's cause I fucked it up like three or four times. So you should just fuck it up once. Um, so moving, moving to the, the next piece I want to talk about before, uh, I'm going to give you a fun fact. So Coach Bob, Coach Morris, uh, most people don't know this. And just because I know you know who he is, Bob was a 110. I don't know if you knew that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, most people don't know that. And when you look at him, you're just like, what? <laughs> yeah, he competed so, uh, with uh, like John Thrush and, yep, Thrush, and, and, yeah. and that, that era of 110s. Insane. You look at that yeah. man now, you're like, how ever were you a 110? But um, but uh, but anyway, so we're at the Arnold and we're sitting there and I like draw the scenario out, guys. Like those of you that are in your car, um, I'm just talking to my hands right now on the podcast. You're not missing anything. But like <laughs> I, I got into weightlifting 2007 after my injury, started fumble fucking with an empty bar, PVC pipe. Um, and like one of the first few names that was out there that I had started being introduced to through YouTube and blogs and shit like that. One of those first few names was your name, Sean, because just my coaches, like one of them was from California. um, And then the others were just involved in weightlifting through a USA weightlifting search. So there was just, your name had been tossed around. And so I just had known your name for a while. Then like fast forward till the CrossFit gym where I was like looking to transition out of the gym I was running to my own thing. And you had the girls and you know, Papa Juan, like everyone was kind of like, things were strumming. Um, so like a lot of attention was on the gym. So I was watching all that, yeah. seeing all the coaching stuff. My girl, Caitlin, that I was coaching was lifting against Allie, like, like in the same sessions, I was watching you at the card table. Like it was just cool seeing everything. And I'm watching from the background, trying to learn everything I can from observation. And we've chit chatted over the years, just like in passing. And I right. obviously just continue to watch things very respectable seeing things you put out and stuff. And then we're finally sitting at the Arnold finally have time to sit with you. And I'm like, well, shit, I have time to like talk to this guy. And like, I think many people would sit there and be like, uh, Sean, what's the secret to fucking stronger athletes? Sean, what's the secret of this? Sean what's the... And out of all of it, I fucking somehow get wrapped up into a conversation, like conversation about sports psychology. Mm. Never would have fucking never would have thought that's where this conversation was going to go. And I don't know if that's because I'm I'm an old man inside of a 36 year old's body. And there's the age joke um, or the uh, or the fact that it was just like a good Zen moment we caught on. 
but we that's where we started chatting and I was like dude I have to get this guy on the podcast because of what he just said and the story was you were telling me about you as an athlete and we were talking about athletes stressing out or how they were handling issues as lifters and how to handle their um, problematic days and when lifts weren't going well, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you actually told me you were, I mean, to use, if I remember your terms right, you were saying you were a shitty lifter. Your first couple of years of being a shitty lifter. You were a great athlete, but a shitty lifter. Uh, you know, I, numbers were decent, but uh, I, was in, I was an inconsistent athlete in weightlifting. Uh, I wouldn't say shitty. I would never say shitty because uh, it wouldn't be true. Uh, Sorry. But uh, I was definitely inconsistent and performing under my abilities. And it was because of the mental approach that I used it, that gave me a lot of success in everything else that I did. I mean, a lot of success in all the other sports. Um, I applied that same process to weightlifting and it was a disaster. And, you know, when I was an athlete outside of weightlifting, because I was athletic and because I was strong and because I was fast and because I had a, a, a good motor and I trained, you know, I've been trained since I'm 13. You know, I've been fascinated with, with training outside of sports since I'm 13. And, um, and I had a pretty good understanding of it. Uh, on, on, on not just the muscle fitness stuff, but like real training. Uh, you know, I, I, it, it, I read everything that, that was put out. You know, I didn't, I shied away from like the, the muscle fitness type stuff and really tried to find some other things. And um, so anyway, you know, I, I just, the things that I was good at were, you know, I was stronger and faster, you know, I was more powerful. Um, and if you were stronger and faster than me in the beginning, you know, I was just going to grind you down and, and just outlast you, you know, so I can, I can def use physicality and use my, impose my will on, on, on an opponent and nearly every time it works. And then I get to weightlifting. And, you know, the so-called opponent is the barbell. And, you know, the barbell does not give a shit about how strong, how fast or powerful you are, how mean you are, how your endurance is to outlast. You're never going to out, you're never going to outdo the barbell. But I took the approach of this barbell is my opponent. I'm going to treat it like I, you know, I, 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 um, I treated you know, the jerk off that stand in front of me, that's, that's in my way. And that was my life. That was how I did it. And I just was lucky enough. So when I went to grad school at Long Beach State, one of my classmates was Mike Trevay, who look him up because he's everywhere. He's, I mean, there's sure there's a, there's a short, list of top sports psychologists in the world he's on that he's definitely on that list finding mastery is his podcast i highly recommend that podcast it's 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 phenomenal he's great at what he okay, does yeah. but when he started he, he was you know we were both grad students together i was i was at, i was in in biomechanics and he was sports psychology so i got a chance to work you know i was one of his early uh, uh, early patients, you know, he had, a, he had a company, I think it was called Pinnacle Performance back in the day. And I think that was his company. And, um, we would meet, uh, weekly and we would talk about, you know, the strategies on how to deal with, you know, the way my brain worked. And so early on, I got exposure to sports psychology, and then I realized how important it was. So, you know, when I say, like, when I came back, I got 30, when I st everything started to click, what I mean by that is 
the mental approach to things started to click. It made sense to me. And it's, I started to understand where you can derive the, the intensity, internal intensity to do these hard things that we're asking ourselves to do. And it doesn't come from rage, right? It, it, it doesn't. And I finally understood that, but you know, too late, but the great thing is now I understand it and I can, yeah. I can teach it. Uh, I'm not saying I'm a sports psychologist from any stretch of imagination, but I have enough tools to use. And when I don't have the tools, I'm lucky. I got, I got a phone and I have this incredible resource. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's, that was my story on, on, uh, you know, why I couldn't take advantage of my athletic gifts in weightlifting when I could do it in other things. No, that story, that story resonated with me because I know like myself as a coach, I've, I like, I didn't play sports growing up. Um, I like, I skated BMX and then like, I played soccer with my friends, like in the field, stuff like that. But sure. like, um, I did outdoor stuff. I was in the Boy Scouts and then like, I went to the army and the army is where like my whole physical life started. And I, I did a bunch of shit there. Um, but like, I train a lot of athletes. I especially train a lot of athletes that are doing that transition from either high school sports to weightlifting or college sports to weightlifting. And again, not to pick on males, but like football is one of the sports where I see this very commonly is it's like, like you were describing to a T is they will, they will attack the bar. Like they are attacking an athlete and they'll just try to go, 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 go. That's football. I mean, that is the mentality. Yeah, and it's, yeah, and it's and it it takes a long time, and I I work with them patiently, and um, I try to engage with them to get them to understand like you have to be smarter than the object because like you're trying to just force the object, and you're not going to win. You're fighting gravity, which is a constant. You're fighting these little nuances, and you're just trying to use like rage and power, which ultimately is actually reducing the more you get fatigued, because that thing's not getting fatigued. And like, so that conversation like really, really resonated with me. And I went and I went and told Tracy about it. And she was like, Oh my God. She like said the two athletes by name. I was like, I know <laughs> like, it was just like, boom. And, um, I think a lot of athletes experience that and it takes them a very long curve to understand like uh, what, what we dub as like, um, in our gym, like we call it the fuck you rap of like, you go, you walk up to the bar, you miss it. And you're just like, Oh, you get angry and you go to try it again. It's like, it's a really big coin flip, whether you're going to make that again, it's at certain percents, it's even almost impossible, but yeah. you think you're going to just muscle it and do it again. And it's like, there's smarter ways to go about this. So it's, it's that story was really good and how you approached it and like figuring out that it's, you can't outwill the barbell effectively. No, but you know, and, and I find the solution to this as a coach and, you know, I work with football uh, a lot and I played football and, and I know the mentality. And, you know, if you look at the problem from the football player's perspective, you know, they have this set of tools that they brought with them their whole life that have worked. Right. Mm -hmm. So then you, they're coming to you or me and we're asking them to do it different. We're asking them and that won't happen until they trust you. Yep. Right. So it takes some time for them to trust you enough to say, you know what, this thing that is like my comfort, like my, my, my security blanket, you know, you're asking me to take it off and do it this other way. So that's, yeah. so some guys are never going to come around, you yeah. know, but I always say that it's the coach's problem because we have to do a good job communicating with them and, and earning that trust enough for them to take a leap and say, you know what, I'm going to do it this way. Yeah. So I always say it's not, the, it's not the athlete that's, that's wrong. It's us for not doing our job. Yeah. And then it's, to even add on to that is like in that field, they also get praised as, as long as they get like, cause in the infantry, it's very similar. Like you get praised as long as you kept well, yeah. moving, you kept trying, like you got praised in football. Like you may have kept getting sacked, but you kept trying and it's like, unfortunately, in weightlifting, like you keep trying, like you keep missing. You're actually starting to kind of grind in some bad habits, and none of it right. is habitual. And, right. 
And then, right, you know, that led into our conversation about Tatiana, which we don't, you know, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but, um, so, so with that, I guess, so when, when did you decide and like, Sean is also going to be the weightlifting coach, but Sean is going to be, I guess, more because when you were a coach, we chatted on this a little bit. When did you decide in that like era of coaching that you were going to do a little bit more of the, uh, the sports psychology field of house? Because during that time, like we talked, like not a lot of coaches were even messing with that in, in any sports, let alone weightlifting. Uh, you know, I think that it's beholden upon the coach to acquire as many tools as they can, um, not only acquire, but know what, you know, know what you end up blowing, you know, like you, you can't just get the <laughs> yeah. tool and tell us it's a nice tool. So I think that. And it's not, you can't do everything, right? Like, is is there's only so much capacity we have. Uh, but um, you know, you got to pick the things that are important, and and you have to determine what that is. And I thought sports psychology made that list for me, and especially because of my experience without it, and then my experience going through it, and I understood the importance of it. Um, and look, not everybody needs it. It's just, yeah. it's not, it's like stretching, right? Not everybody needs to stretch. You know, they get enough from doing full movements. Uh, some people don't need sports psychology and that's fine. But if you do, you got to have, the, uh, as a coach, you have to have some tools to offer. And if they're not enough, you know, because you're not going to be like with nutrition. I got some tools to offer, but you know, if if I got a question, you know, I I call Mike Isertel and I ask him, or I ask you know any number of the other resources that have a heck of a lot better than this than I am. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important for us to have a to be able to have a conversation about anything on a base level to anybody to an expert, and then have enough resources. That, uh, that you can say, hey, you know what? This is this is a little bit, I'm swimming a little outside of my depth here. Let me hook you up with this guy or this, you know. And I think that t it takes, you know, some coaches' ego won't allow them to let that, you know, to let them ask, they'll let the athletes out in a while to other to other people. Uh, you know, that's that's a whole other conversation. It's sadly true. But, uh so that's how, you know, so sports psychology from an early, from, from when I realized how much I needed it, um, I, uh, you know, I, I actually, uh, sport, the whole concept of sports psychology is a kind of an odd story, but it was brought into my consciousness when I was really young, the nine, 10 years old, 11 years old. I, I was a pitcher in baseball, and my dad and I were going back at a. We lived in a housing project, and they had like some grass strips, so we'd go out in the back and and you know we we throw, and then little did I know, so we had a neighbor downstairs, Joe Gunther, I'll never forget him. Um, an old guy uh, was widowed, um, good shape, he's always walking, and then he walked by once, he and he would watch and he'd talk, and it's come to find out this guy played in the Yankee organization. Um, he was a pitcher. Did I heard you got a lot of crazy ass stories, Sean, like this, that you just know people <laughs> that did. <laughs> I've been blessed. I've treated interesting people. Um, and, you know, he, we talked, like he would, then he started coming with us every time we'd go downstairs and go down, I'd walk downstairs and ring his bell, and, you know, Joe would go down. So he'd come down and my dad was really great because he was a, ba he was a baseball coach. So he's learning from a guy and, you know, we, we do all these dr drills and things like that. But, the, but the thing, uh, you know, he talked to me about the mental approach to pitching, you know, uh, and it was the first time I heard anybody say anything about the mental approach to anything other than output, right? Like, you know, be tougher, you know, the, like you have to be mentally tough, 
But this is like, no, you got to use your brain to strategize your moves. So that was the first time. So like, it's interesting. Like when, when I met Mike Gervais, it brought me back to those days. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, that's because I didn't really grasp the concept. I was like 10 years old. But then as soon as I started working with Mike, I, I, you know, I have like these flashbacks and I'm like, okay, I understand what he said, what we, what he was saying. So I think, you know, it was hiding in my brain somewhere. And then it just got triggered by a different experience. But, uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's important, you know, if it's important until it's not important. I, I, you know, if I know a lot of athletes that don't need it. Yeah. They just don't. Um, but I think it's it's important for us to have that. Uh, they should be able to have that conversation at a base level. Mm-hmm. Do you um? So, with with your book coming, all right. Transition to that. The book coming out, all right. Really interested in. I know a bunch of parties that are already asking. Like, a can I get the hookup? So we'll talk on that after because. <laughs> Tracy, Tracy has actually been running around talking about it a bunch. Um, and then I've wanted it. And then I talked to my wife about it, who, you know, Amanda's like, she's done CrossFit and stuff like that. I guess I'm going to sell like four copies at least. I'm four copies at least at four star, right? Uh, <laughs> so like, but I, I think personally, um, you know, I know, I know personally I'm going to post it in like my, uh, my 82nd unit that deployed, I'm going to post it up in there because I think it's going to be very important for those guys. Um, and we chatted on that, but your book suffer smarter. Um, you know, it's going to be coming out soon. Um, you describe it as like how to choose productive discomfort to creating lifelong growth. Uh, you and your co author, co writer, co writer. Okay. Um, Peter Heitzman, uh, you'll learn concrete strategies to improve. Uh, you handle how you imprint, uh, handle adversity, discomfort, stress through lens of strength training. Um, really, like, let's break this down so that way people listening know what they're getting when they get the book. But also, like, to start it, like, why did we write the book, Sean? Mm-hmm. All right, I know you personally to the level of, like, a surface-level personal relationship. Yeah. I know um, – here's what I know. I know the – uh, man sitting in front of me looks a lot different than the man that was around a few years ago. Congratulations on that. Thanks. Right. I know the man sitting in front of me had a fucking gym in one of the only weightlifting gyms to exist in a city that is just extremely fucking hard to even own space in. So congrats on that. And then I also know you moved your whole fucking life across the country. So like, congrats <laughs> on that. And then you write a book about fucking suffering, bud. So like, give us the fucking scoop, man. I want to know the people are going to want to hear, like, tell us about the book. Why was it written? Who is it written for? And then let's dive into that. Yeah. Um, so start 2008, 2009, I physically started to decline. Um, I had I hurt my knee fell off a pull. I was trying to, I was, I was living in my office. I just opened up my gym and I, you know, I was working 16, 20 hours a day, living in my office. Just, uh, I had to live in my office. I didn't have any, I, I was broke. Um, and then I, I'd sit at the desk and then I'd get up and I had like a pull up bar in, in, in the, in the gym. And I just walk out and I would just hang, just kind of decompress. And, and I did that just, and I passed out and, and fell off the bar and wound up uh, hyper flexing my, my left knee. And from that moment on, so it was about 2007, 2008, um, you know, although I was, you know, I wasn't doing nothing, but I, I stopped wanting to move a lot because of the pain. And then the knee deteriorated over the years into my hip. So, you know, by the time 2014, 15, 
come around. I'm not doing good physically. I'm not doing good mentally because, um, you know, I just moving around is hard. Now, it's oddly enough, right? So I'm still squatting 500 pounds. You know, I've squatted 500 pounds every year for uh, 28, no, 40, 38 years. I think from 16 on, it's other than two years. So, you know, I was still able to do those things. I can, at that, you know, I was still up until around there, I was still clean and jerking, you know, snatching around three, clean and jerking well, you know, into the threes. Um, and that was the only thing I did. Outside of that, I wasn't moving. And, you know, I started to realize, you know, I just, I felt like I needed something else. In 2016, I started jiu-jitsu. And by this time, I'm pretty crippled. Like, I can't walk up and down stairs without, but normally. Um, so I started jiu-jitsu, and a couple things happened. Uh, you know, even I was in being as beat up as I was, I walked into that room, and I was the strongest, you know, fastest guy in there. Uh, and, and I had a lot of friends that I, I trained fighters for a long time, and I was a fighter, not MMA, but boxing. Um, so I know, like, and I, I wrestled, and but the, I worked at an MMA gym, so I saw, like, high-level, high-level guys went through this. Uh, it was raw in El Segundo, like, one of the first MMA gyms where Dan Henderson started and Couture and all these guys. So, you know, I got a chance to see all that. So anyway, I start jiu-jitsu, and... Um, Chambray method uh, is in Lawndale, and it was it was Nino and his brother Pepe. Pepe was a uh, much smaller than I was, much smaller. Uh, so Nino, the the professor, recognized you know I was a little beat up but strong and fast, and because whenever they would put me with the other white belts, I would I would mop them up just because, but not with technique. Just cause I, was, I actually I was, know exactly where you're at, Sean, because I just recently started. Just right, like, right. You would know that. I would just budget them with strength. So like, yeah. he's not learning anything. So they would put me with Pepe. Now, I'm telling you, Pepe is probably half my weight. And the instant I started with him, I started to panic. Like, when I would leave the training, I would panic. I started to panic because that's for the first time it made me realize how vulnerable I was as a human physically where that's been the thing, you know, I'm the, I'm the lion. Yeah. Right. And now I come out of there and I, I'm not lying. Yeah. You got exposed. And I started to really, that started to put me into a, into a, uh, a weird headspace. Um, but the good news is, you know, whenever I get into those spaces, I just, I make sure I spend time thinking about it. Like what, you know, what's going on? Like what? And so that year, um, I continued. And every time I finished, I mean, I was, I, I just was get more fearful and because I've become exposed myself to being more and more uh, uh, incompetent as a man. And then I said, screw it. I got to do something about it. I have my hip replaced. Um, at 2017, I said, I got to, I got to do something. And then I got that replaced and still my, my training was just, uh, heavy lifting. How Real heavy. that? Where are you, John? Just to pause real quick. How afraid of that were you? What? How afraid of that were you? That surgery and to get that surgery done and everything. Oh, I, I wasn't afraid at all of surgery. I was just no. afraid of not having the surgery. Well, you know how our athletes are, like lifters especially, of like surgery, never being able to do something again, et cetera, like that. Well, I couldn't That's do anything. Saying. Yeah. I couldn't do anything. You had already reached that point. Yeah, I, I was, I was, I should have had it done 
before, but I just wasn't ready. Okay. Um, so I had the surgery and I, and, you know, I rehabbed it and then, you know, I went back to, you know, what I knew, you know, 2018, just lifted heavy and I didn't feel the same. Like I, although I was lifting these big weights, I didn't, something was missing and, and I would watch CrossFit. Um, you know, I was, had a lot of friends and CrossFit and I remember watching it early on and the thing that impressed me the most and this is this was I would always like get uh I was always really interested in how much they suffered right and I was like yeah you know I don't feel like that anymore you know I'm lifting these heavy weights like it's it, I'm, it's like a, a veneer like from the outside of suffrage, not this 500 pounds on my back and I'm exerting myself, but I'm not, it doesn't make me uh, like anxious. I see that barbell. I don't give a shit. I've done it a million times. I've done much more than that. So it was, I, I, I started to kind of put two and two, two together. When I think about the problem for me it was like, you know what? I don't have any discomfort physical discomfort or suffering in my life. And then I, I set up the prowler. I had these, you know, three giant bay doors. Uh, and then the last one was like, I had some equipment, like lifting equipment, leg press and things in there. It wasn't a highly trafficked area, people coming in and out. So I, I set the prowler up right against the gate. And that thing sat there for months, untouched, unmoved. Right. And I would look at it and I would Intense, get, but no action. I would get fear. I would, I would feel fear because I remember I, 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 although I, I really wanted this suffering. I remember watching CrossFitters and what they felt, what they looked like. And I'm like, yeah, I want that, but I don't know if I want to feel that way. Like I want what I, I was just, I couldn't bring myself for months to, to do it. Um, then I, uh, I started to train a little bit differently, like things that I could do consistently. Like I used to, I started to think about what I do today can't affect my ability to do anything tomorrow. So that's the, 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 the parameter I set for myself. Still wasn't able to push because it was still weight related. Right. Even like body weight stuff or which burn like locally, I go do like single leg something and man, I get this crazy burn. But at the end, it's not fucking hard. It's a one like squat. So things like that. And then I was like, OK, I'm better, but I'm not there. And then I pushed that prowler. Out in the park, I got, you know, I get there six in the morning. And I didn't even stop moving. I opened up my door. I dropped my keys. I opened up the gate, pushed the thing out, and just set a clock and just pushed it. And I don't know if it was five, it's probably five minutes, man, maybe five minutes. And I was like, I, I, I didn't, it was on the floor, but I, I, like I was there and I felt like, uh, like I, I just untied a knot of, just emotion. And I started, I started crying. I get emotional thinking about it. Like I started crying and uh, I realized, oh my God, this is the, this is the answer. Yeah. Right. So how do I find this in my life again? I can't do it this way. Right. I can't, I can't, I can't do it the way I used to do it. I can't run, you know, I can't be on a football field. I just, killing myself. I can't be, you know, I can't do all these things that I've experienced this suffering from, this physical suffering. So I had to find, I got to find a way to, to get that back into my life. And COVID hit. <laughs> yeah, great timing. And it, well, it was actually great timing for me. In a lot of ways. Yeah, no, lot that's what I'm saying. Great timing. It's a great timing to fucking do some self-discovery, man. So 
I hooked up with my, so one of my best friends out in LA is a chef. He had a rest, really successful restaurant. Uh, that was, uh, and then he opened up this other one, Hollywood and Vine, like right in the middle of like ho- of, of of Hollywood, LA. And then COVID hits, you know. So he's got investors, he's got, and he can't open up his restaurant. So the both of us sitting there with a thumb up our ass, and we're both going through some similar stuff. So we agreed we were gonna train together, you know, every morning, and. The second time I pushed that prowler was with, with, with Adam. Mm. And then we did, you know, I would design, like he, I would design the training and the training became a lot of these things that aren't barbell work. We didn't touch a barbell. I didn't have shoes on other than to push the prowler. Like I just changed everything. And I just did things that I would make me suffer but I can come the next day and I can, I can operate normally. And then that transformation, that decision to do that, all of a sudden I was like, man, this is, I got to write, I got to write about this, you know, just for my own self. It's because there's something here. I said, I can't be the only guy. Mm-hmm. Can't be the only guy that feels this way. Maybe it's not for the same reasons, right? Maybe they got here differently. Maybe they never were physical, yeah. Right? But they're feeling the same way. And I'm saying, well, the answer, the one that I th- that works for me, it's not the only answer, but the one that works for me is physical activity. Yep. And I think, and I, I I'll say this, you know, and I'll debate anybody. You know, I, I, there's nobody that can tell me that moving around and doing hard physical things is not the cure for a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah, give a shit who you are, how many initials you got after your name. You're not going to tell me that, that that moving, more moving is better than less moving. The st- the, the the key is figuring out what that looks like and how you can do it. What you know, what's comfortable about, what's comfortable to you to be uncomfortable with. Yep. You know, it's it, to me weights. I make sense to me, so that's what I talk. So I I I push that, but it's not the only thing. I mean, a good friend, you know, friend of mine, Jay Ashman. You know, he's he's. Uh, fairly popular guy in fitness world. He was a big, strong man, rugby, powerlifting. And, you know, he kind of went through a similar journey as me. He's doing, and he got, he's doing jiu-jitsu. He's like all in, all in. And he's still training, but his training is more like, you know, not the same. But he's getting, and he's a guy, you know, like me, needs discomfort, physical. He found it through jujitsu. So, um, and then I I reached out because I can't type very well. So I and I needed I needed somebody else. So I reached out to Phil White, who has put out a lot of like Kelly Sturette's books and Andy Galpin and and uh, and I and I had done some work with him. I think he was at Bar Band or one of the other companies, I'd written some articles for him and I know that he, and then he was getting into book pub. So I reached out to him and I said, Hey, I need, you know, would you write this book with me? He says, no, he was already committed. He says, no, but I got some guys that we can interview. Yeah. And then I, I met Pete Heitzman, who's, I couldn't have done this book without him. And, you know, we would set times together and, and, you know, I said, I told Pete, I said, you know, ask me questions. And let me answer these questions, and, and and that's what we did, man. We did it for years. We we just sat, and he asked me questions, and I would answer them, and then he would, you know, he'd send them, you know, he would make the heads and tails of it, send it back, and you know, that's how we wrote. That's how we wrote the book, and and uh, but I wrote the book really as a it's a as a cathartic. Um, 
as a as a as a cathartic exercise, you know, for me. Yeah. And then well, it's kind of it's kind of like a diary to I guess a degree, right? It's a, yeah, I mean, it's just a diary it, that others can enjoy and 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 also like be along there on that journey with you while they take it themselves. Well, you know, and I have other, you know, really high, but Mike Gervais in the book, right? You know, I have other high performers in there. Yeah, I interviewed them. One of my best friends, Greg Vinovich, who's, he was one of the best college volleyball player, uh, volleyball coaches in, in the world. He won a gold, he won the first, uh, he helped uh, win the first gold, beach volleyball gold medal. You know, he was the coach, he was the only guy, the only, the only team that had a coach. Was and these guys were not even in the mix to win, you know. And, and he broke down all the tapes. I mean, he was way ahead of his time, and he was on the cusp of being like, you know, getting a big. He was a, always an assistant, except for, uh, he was a head guy at a junior college, and they set all kind of records. And he was he was on the cusp of getting a big, full time volleyball job. And then he said, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. He became a a guide, he guided people up mountains. He's been up Everest and all the, climbed all the mountains. And then he, you know, he just said, screw this. I'm going to do this. So his story is really interesting. Um, yeah. you know, uh, he was the best, like I've never seen a guy in the, where he fits in the book, be able to communicate with athletes in a way that get them to do things that they know that they wouldn't normally ever do. So anyway, but you know, it's a, it's a book about, you know, the, the importance of, of, of stressing yourself uncomfortably and how it, how to do it. You know, it, it's not a training book. Like you don't expect, you know, it's not full of training programs. There's no training programs in there really. At the very end, you know, we talk a little bit about the, the squat, push, squat push press and, and deadlift you know, here's how to do it. Uh, here's how here's how to find the gym. Here's what to look for. Here, here are the questions you need to ask a you know a, a coach. You know things yeah. like that at the end. But leading up to that, it's it's the story of of uh, why it's important to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and because and I can write about it with you know. It's it's a visceral it's 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 in me because I went through it. Um, well, it's a very it's a very hard topic to to discuss and like. Well, that's why it took I, seven years to write because it was really yeah, uncomfortable. It, <laughs> and there were times you said you're a bad just, you said you're a bad typer. That's you already told us why it took seven. No, years. no, that's not why. That's not why. <laughs> there were times when I just didn't want to talk about it. I'm just giving you shit. Yeah. Um, no, I, I just, it, it would be, you know, we went stretches, especially uh, up until tw 2020. Uh, yeah. We went through long stretches of time where I just didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. You know, Pete, Pete was great. Like, he understood, like, in a very short period of time, he understood who he was dealing with. Like, what my wacko, sometimes wacko ways of doing things. Um, so, God bless him. But when I moved, when I closed my gym and I moved to Utah, I didn't do anything for six months. I, I, I have a house right up, right on the base of the mountain. My backyard is pretty much the mountain. So every morning, you know, I'd get up and I'd sit in the backyard, look at the mountains and the birds, hang out with Ella and my dog, uh, um, and think. And then I was like, all right, I'm ready for this shit. Because I didn't have anything else going on. I didn't want anything else going on. Um, yeah. And then that's when everything accelerated. So we would speak, not every day, but definitely every week. Mm -hmm. And um, it really started to, to, come, to come into form. So yeah. it, just, it just, I needed a break from everything. Uh, yeah, the, the escaping from California was, I mean, I was, that's a story in and of itself. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I was broken 
I was broken in so many ways when I got to Utah. <laughs> so yeah. that six months did me did me so much good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean like one of the one of the things that I like I tell people and I, I say it and I just kinda like breeze over it because there's no way I can ever convey but like there's pretty much like three points that I know that I like you're like the the suffering type of conversation was like there's a lot of self discovery, which is what I think happens when you're when you're suffering or you're you're in that extreme discomfort phase, is you're at a physiological and psychological meetup of you're figuring out like as a fucking human being whether you're doing this shit or not and whether you want to or don't want to at like the most base elemental like there's no fluff it's it's you're either happening or not and like i definitely like the the one of the major points where i figured out a lot of who matt was was like when i was in at like special forces selection and assessment like i ultimately was a like I med dropped like 36 hours before I ended it. That's its own story. But like those 19 and a half days of that school of the 21 days, like out of two and a half years, a 16 month of deployment in Iraq and other shit I did my whole life leading up to that. And those fucking 19 days, I actually learned, I learned so much about myself because the situation I put myself in and fucking deciding as a human being what I was going to dictate I was going to do and accomplish and whether I was going to do it or not. And like the inches I fought for mentally to accomplish. Like that's that like as far as I'm concerned, that's when I like bloomed into the fucking version of who I am now. And then there's like two other points in my life where like those events happen. But like I think a lot of times what you described and what I described, I think just a lot of people, and like call this a hot take, it's not knocking anyone. I just think a lot of people just don't push themselves to get there. We live a life of comfort, and it's not a bad thing. Like, fuck, man, I don't think anyone should have to be living in a village worried like a fucking rival tribe is going to come slay everyone just because. Like, <laughs> it's not a great way to live either. But, but absent that, fear and absent the things you have to do to survive in that environment, we become worse as well. Yeah. So we have to find ways of, again, you know, like, like, you know, I set that expectation. What can I do today to suffer? That's not going to affect my ability to do things tomorrow. Yep. So when you're living that life, when you're worried about the, the, the truck, I mean, you're training, right? You're battening down the hatches. You're sharpening your, like, you're, you're, you're preparing. So absent that, what are you preparing for? I, for me, I'm preparing. So when I'm 90 years old, when I'm 100 years old, I don't have to have somebody wipe my ass for me. Hey, dude, bingo. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. I say that shit all the time. People think I'm kidding. Sean, I worked in a retirement home. As a teenager, I worked in a retirement home and I said, fuck that. I'm never paying someone That's... to fucking do the shit that I, as a 16 year old, I'm getting overpaid to do. Fuck yeah, I'm that. not, I, I'm, you know, for me, the numbers that I, that I, that I'm running after now are the ones on my blood work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah. I, I want to see, you know, I have particular markers that I look at that are important to me and, and, and indications of, of, of health and longevity. Uh, and I, I want to maintain, uh, uh, adult, at least a double body weight squat and deadlift for as long as I can. Right. So, and, and I, I'd like to, and the other, the other metric for me is I'd like to run as close to a six minute mile as I can. Damn, that's that's it. Good. That's what I'm looking at. Like, so it, it frees me to make all the choices I want because before when I'm saying, well, I got to clean and jerk this. If you want to clean and jerk this, you got to train a certain way. If you want to squat this giant, you got to train a certain way. For me, I'm there already. Like I'm squatting over double body weight 
You know, I'm I'm deadlifted all the time. So I don't give a shit about any of that. So my training is not, it's not training, it's exercising. Right? But I'm exercising with intent. Yeah. And for these other numbers. And I think that is important for for guys like us who we're not athletes anymore. The numbers mm-hmm. The old numbers don't matter. They make great stories, but they shouldn't yeah. be a, uh, a guide for how you live your life. You know, it's, you should have, so when I figured out the different numbers, then I'm like, okay, I got my numbers back. Yep. So now I'm going to fucking go. Let's go. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm equally as motivated. I just need the right number. Yeah. So I got it now. Yeah, and, and I think I think that's why the military thing, like I really like one one of the things I wanna do eventually is like I wanna delve a little bit more into like the the whole like veteran scene and just mental health stuff with that. But like physical fitness I think is a huge missing component of when we get out. Yeah, it's a variable I continue to see, and like not to go down the rabbit hole on that because we are at like a minute, like an hour twelve. But like, you go from this group that is regimented and like you know, Shawshanked, basically institutionalized, every day regimented, wake up, do physical fitness, which is like we know there's so much evidence supporting a healthy body, healthy brain, or at least that's a start. And then we go, we get out of the military, and we just like, all right, I'm waking up. What do I do? And they all stop working out. They all stop having this tribe to work out and have expectations. Right. And then we see a huge population of mental dump. Um, so like your book, I think is going to be maybe extremely helpful for guys. Like we're not out run gunning anymore. We're not out there trying to uh, kill PT test and uh, be in peak physical. Th- like dude, the, the infantry especially was so fucking toxic <laughs> To, and like when it came to just alpha mentality and like you had to be the top dog. You're always fighting, be the top dog in your squad and your fire team and your company, right. because that's just how you survived. You, if you weren't, you were just a shithead and you got rolled over. So you were just always fighting to be on the top. And like, now you're just a civilian. I think a lot of our guys lose that element of like, what am I doing? Like, what am I, what should I do even and then they lose their physical health. Then they start to get depressed. They go down the yeah. rabbit hole. And it's just very sad because, like, they were pushing themselves to wild limits, whether they were on deployment or schools. And I think your book is really going to help them. But here's a question. The population, like, we were kind of hinting at, because with respect to them, I know many of them. What about the population that just – They've led quote unquote soft lives. They've had good lives. They haven't yeah. suffered. Well, you know, I think they want to get harder. They need that quote unquote mental toughness and to develop it for their own weightlifting careers or their own sporting careers or just want to be harder. Yeah, and I, I think it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not just people who are weightlifting now, but I think anybody, like uh, to me, if you have lived uh, a, a, I hate the word to use soft, but if you if if yeah, you no, used, if you've lived a life absent yeah. of physical exertion, um, and you feel and you're at a point in your life that you don't feel well, then try something different, right? That doesn't come in a bottle, right? So that's the easy thing. And I'm not saying it's not the right thing in certain situations. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, no, you should throw away. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is, if you've never done anything physical before, we know the science, right? There's science that says physical activity is good. You know, it, we can get into the details of what good means, but it's, it's not. I, I don't think there's anybody that would debate that. So if it's absent in your life and it has been forever, what, you know, maybe your entry into it is walking for five minutes. Like it doesn't have to be this grand thing. Like when I'm in trouble, 
Like when I'm, when my life is, when I'm not managing it right, the first thing that's, it's, I don't know why, but the, the, the two things that, that stop, I stop doing is making my bed and brushing my teeth on a regular basis. I know when that starts to happen, I got to take a break. I got to do whatever I got to do to get back to that. And you'd be surprised. It's not as easy as you might think. Just make your bed. Just brush your teeth. If you've ever been there and people know what I'm talking about, it's not as easy as you decided to do it. So maybe that manifests itself differently in other people. That's how it manifests itself in me. Luckily, because it could be a lot worse. So yeah. your entry into this world, maybe it's making your bed. Maybe it's brushing your teeth. Maybe it's making your bed, brushing your teeth, going for a five-minute walk. Maybe it's making your bed, brushing your teeth, going for a five-minute walk, and doing a push-up. Right? See what I'm saying? It's like, it doesn't have to be going to a gym. It doesn't have to be doing anything. But take, but showing your, your brain that you have some level of control to do uncomfortable things. Because I promise you, there have been times when making my bed has been uncomfortable. And it, it's hard to describe if you've never experienced it. But if you have experienced it, you'll know what I'm talking about. So there's no excuse. There's, there's an entry point for everybody. Because we know it's good for you. So try it. So I think the book can help get, give people permission to do things that might not look like training, but really are. It is. Yeah, it is training. It's something abnormal you're not used to. It's going to put you out of your normal regimen, and it's going to put you into a new regimen. It's, it's going to make you uncomfortable. So, so it, if you're not comfortable being uncomfortable, then find things to do to make yourself uncomfortable. And they don't have to be like what you think it is. Yeah. You know, saying no to the cup of ice cream that you have every night before you go to bed. That's uncomfortable if that's what you've been doing for 20 years, 40 years, whatever. Yeah. So, hope, you know, that's the message. And I hope it resonates. Yeah. I think it's going to be great, man. I think, um, like I said, I already know there's a, a big interest in it. Um, it's, it, it needs to be written. I think, I think it's also going to just create a lot of yeah, this, the, the buzz term vulnerability. I think it also seeing it a top, like call it what it is, a top American coach being vulnerable like this is also just going to be great for our space, to be blunt. I think there's a big fake-ass facade on coaching that we're like these fucking invulnerable people that never fuck up, never have issues, never are unhappy, never have regrets, all these things. And uh, like you being at the, like as a top coach in the country, being in it for a long time, it's uh, going to be a good beacon for coaches to kind of follow and be a little bit more comfortable talking about shit too. Because I know yeah. many of you both know that there's a lot of mental stress that goes with this career. Yeah. You know, it's a privilege to do, do this thing, you know, and, and, you know, nobody has to do it. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to do this and other hard things, if you're going to do it for a long time, if you're going to do it, you know, well, for a long time, you know, you got to, at some point, you got to figure out what are your impediments to doing it well for a long time. Like when we're younger, it, we just have a, it's not, we don't have any more resilience, but I think that, you know, our, our, our capacity for multiple traumatic and stressful things is probably a little bit more, or maybe we're just smarter as we age, as we get older and realize I'm not fucking dealing with this shit. Um, I gotta, I gotta come up with a better way. So for me, it was like, you know, I, I don't like the complexity of all the fires that I have to put out all the time. You know, it just takes away time that I just, I want to sit here and look at the birds. 
and think about the next day or or spend time with my family, you know, in a meaningful way, not just being present and not there, you know? Um, So, you know, I think we got to call it. I want to do this forever until people, until it, you know, they throw that first thing and dirt on me. Um, And how do I do it? How do I, how do I continue to thrive? You know, how you do it is you eliminate the bullshit of things that you create yourself. I created a lot of problems for myself with the decisions I've made. And I love solving problems. I almost like I'm, I'm creating problems so I can just solve them. I really think that that was part of it. This vicious loop. But I became really good at solving problems, you know, but it didn't have to go that way. It probably was a, there was a better way to... But so now it's, you know, it's, it's, it's picking your spots, you know, it's carrying a, you know, a, a tight group of people who you care about what they think about you. And then everybody else, I don't give a shit what you think. Yeah. So like that relieves, because when you're young and, you know, you care about everybody, you know, all that stuff. And I'm like, I don't give a shit, except for this group of people who I can call up at three in the morning and say, meet me over in this spot. They don't ask any questions. They show up, Mm -hmm. you know, guns loaded. Yeah. So those people, if they call me up, they say, Hey, Sean, this, you got, you should watch this. Something's not, I pay attention. Everybody else. Yeah. Don't care. And that in and of itself frees up a ton of bandwidth. Yeah. So, I don't think it's possible when you're younger. I don't think we're designed, but some, maybe some are, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. So Sean, where is the book going to be available? That's the first question that I'm getting asked a billion times. So right now uh, I'm going to do it uh, on Amazon because they have, they do print on demand. Yep. So uh, that's going to be the first way and then i'm gonna do uh an audio version get this i'm gonna be the one talking so that's gonna be a whole a whole thing but uh yeah i figure if it's my story it's gotta come from my mouth so i'll try to clean up my accent a little bit but we'll see uh keep it so it'll be it'll be available in audio i don't know how i don't have a date on that i don't even know what that what that entails yet uh yeah so that's the plan. No, that'll be good. A lot of people ingest audiobook. I, I know I do personally. Um, just with well, little time I have, I do audiobooks a lot. I love reading, but now um, with you, I, it's so I'm gonna make, I'll, I'm gonna probably make that available sooner than later because I've actually got a lot of uh, inquiries about that. Yeah. Um. Awesome. We're gonna shift gears, lighten the load off. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, trying to figure out our end game here. Uh, I went, I went with a little bit of, um, sticking to the theme, so to say, but, uh, you know, I wanted to go with some suffering. Now, me and you are a little older than maybe some of the people listening, but there was a game that my wife actually came up with the idea. And, um, it was, it was a game that was, you know, the old show fear factor, Mm. And uh, they always had they always had the options of like doing the disgusting tasks, right? Or the uh, the things you the challenges. Um, so she suggested you know we do something fear factor esque, and I got a little short on time, but I also knew that this was going to run long, and this was an outstanding podcast. And we'll come back to talking about that. But in regards to the game, we're going to do our end game on suffer or not. So we have a couple scenarios here. I've typed up. Um, we'll chat, we'll chat on whether Sean's going to decide to suffer or pass, um, based on the scenarios. There's no right or wrong answer besides how the population that listens, all, uh, all 15 listeners I have, um, whether they judge you or not. Um, but our, uh, our first one is going to be, um, would you go to work for the day in your singlet you wore back in the day, Sean, as an athlete, if you doubled your salary after that day? Would you suffer through that humiliation? Well, or would you so pass on the opportunity? I, I work for myself in my weightlifting, 
But so I would do it there, no problem. But at the high school, it might be a little weird. So probably I would, <laughs> would you pass be able the to high do school. it. Pass the high school. You also as with those old style singlets, are we going to be okay wearing that? Yeah, I think that might be some kind of violation. So, uh, yeah. All right. So. In this scenario, um, whether you're going to suffer or pass, would you be able to retrieve the keys to a to, to a room that was going to crush, Star Wars style, uh, a loved one filled with chicken feet and live rats, but you can only use your mouth to get that key, Sean? Are you going to be able to suffer through that to save the loved one? Or yeah. You just got to pass it. If, if you're in my group, then yeah. If you're not in that group. That was, by the way a real fear factor challenge that happened oh, really? uh, on couples on couples edition. And there was people that failed that challenge. <laughs> so, yeah. One of my, lo- I'll, I give uh, my life one. one of my loved ones. So I'll suffer. Like it. Love it. Um, I would probably just get distracted. I'd be like, this is like star Wars. How cool. And then I would <laughs> That's have, right. have it's a <laughs> Yeah, like I, I literally have Star Wars shit like up here on my mantle. Um, so I'm so old that uh, I saw Star Wars, in the first one, in the movie theater. Yeah, and now you're like a fucking hero to me even more. So that's good. We've just it, elevated like your whole status on my shelf. Um, I, yeah, well. I, I age. You can go back to your heyday of strength, but you only squat 20s, bro. Are you going to do that? No. Are you going to be able to go back to as strong as Sean was, but only squat in 20s? No. No? I'll pass. I'll pass. All righty. Uh, you're going to get your athlete a gold medal, Sean, but you can never coach again. No. Uh, no. Gold medal no. at the Olympics? At the Olympics. No. Nah. hard one. No, nah, I love coaching, man. Yeah? Yeah. I wouldn't do that. I'd pass. Let's, so let me let me throw a fucking a bender in here because All I right. just thought of it. Knock on wood. All right, before people hate on me, we're all good. The sport's good right now, but you know it's the last one. Nah, I don't care. Okay. Yeah, I, I love. I don't. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what else to do. I I feel you. I, my wife is always afraid that, like, I'm going to fucking go Ted Lasso mode one day and just, like, start coaching, like, volleyball out of nowhere somehow. <laughs> I don't know. I'll figure it out. Fuck it. <laughs> and I believe uh, this might be our last one, maybe one more. But um, uh, you have to eat a whole bucket of cow intestines, all right, like a Home Depot bucket, but the nonprofit of your choice gets $10,000. Can you suffer through this? Not for, for, the, for the nonprofit. Not for ten grand. Hundred grand, I'd do. Not for ten grand. Not for ten grand. That would do it. I've also ate a lot of weird shit throughout the world, so that doesn't bother me, I guess. Yeah, not for ten. Ten grand that can't make a difference. Ten grand. Yeah, I'm uh, not gonna. You're I'm going not gonna to eat that for ten grand. This is the last one. This is the last All one. Right. Uh, I remember. You're going to have to become Mike Tyson's training partner, a.k.a. punching bag, for a year, but you will learn every piece of knowledge that that man has. Can you suffer through that? Right now, AKA I can this page. You said you like suffering. Yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole <laughs> level, man. <laughs> nah, man. He's not going to kill you. He's not going to kill you. I boxed. I grew up boxing and I've been hit hard and uh but think of the knowledge that guy has man yeah but I wouldn't know any of it because I I'd be brain damaged by the end of it you kidding me <laughs> that is also valid I don't that is also valid I, I don't want to get in the ring with that guy I don't care how <laughs> you know, unless I can have a weapon of some kind like a long time like a yeah, like a, a pipe <laughs> or a javelin. All right, so 
Awesome. Thanks for playing that. Like I said, I just try to do that kind of loosen everything up at the end. Um, awesome, awesome show. Thank you for coming on. Definitely want to have you on again. Uh, I heard you just have like crazy stories, everything from. Yeah, but I'm not telling those to the public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard just some fun ones that well, are that. You know, but, a, um, a life that's you gotta you gotta live a life that's that's worth living. You know. Yeah, and, uh, that's. So, I agree with that. I, I I agree. You should be able to tell stories that people think you're halfway lying on that are totally true. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Sean, where can people find you on social media if they are trying to find you? Yeah. Right now, Instagram. My uh, I have two two accounts, but the one that I'm I'm uh, uh, interacting with is uh, Sean underscore Waxman, uh, and then uh, I have a Substack, which I'm gonna be posting more long form stuff. Uh, and I, I think it's just Sean Waxman. Um, awesome. And then at some point when I can figure out how to rearrange and clean up my YouTube page, uh, I'll start posting more long form stuff on there. So, uh, awesome. but uh, along with the book, I'm going to start some online like group stuff and, uh, and just a way to develop a community. So that'll, yep. uh, that'll be involved as well. Just to your point, I think you need to say with your guys, you know, they, yeah, they, 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 they stop, you know, being war, uh, being war fighters and they come home, they don't have a community anymore, you know, so I think there's a lot of that going on. So I want to try to create a community of guys that, that you know, want to exert themselves, be physical, um, and feel, you know, feel better and kind of help guide people through that. So that that's coming eventually too, probably through Substack. I love it. Um, other than that, Sean, uh, let's go with one more thing. Sean, you've got one sentence advice to young coaches out there. What is it? Mm, one sentence to advice to young coaches. Uh, Try to be great at what you do and, you know, and, and make sure you measure greatness. You know, I know it's, it's that, that's not part of the sentence. Just greatness, we'll, greatness we'll has illegally punctuate. <laughs> yeah. Just, well, you know what, whatever that means to you, that that'll tell, that'll tell the world a lot about who you are. I love it. Right. So try to be great. at something. I dig it, man. Uh, Sean, thank you for your time again, dude. Awesome topic. Can't wait for the books. Can't wait for everything. Uh, you've been an influence in mine and I'm sure many others' lives. So thanks for hopping on, man. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate your time. And uh, and if you guys have any questions, you can uh, hit me up on, uh, on Instagram. All right. Have a good day, Sean. Thank you. Thanks.